Our guest this weekend is Jim Rickards, the chief global strategist at West Shore Funds and also the author of his strategic intelligence newsletter. Now, Jim is a very fascinating guy and an expert in both geopolitics and global capital. So we'll be talking currency wars. We discuss how much longer and whether the Fed can continue to prop up equity and bond markets, what sort of global debt and currency shocks we might be in store for in the coming 18 months, whether the IMF will be able to capitalize on those shocks and make its case to create some sort of monster global currency based on special drawing rights, and who wins and who loses around the world when the game of monetary musical chairs comes to an end. So if you're interested in the fate of the U.S. dollar, the euro, and what's happening in global currency markets, stay tuned for a great interview with Jim Rickards. Jim Rickards, welcome to Mises Weekends, and thanks so much for joining us for the first time. Thank you, Jeff. Great to be with you. Well, first and foremost, Jim, it appears that your long ago prediction that the Fed would continue suppressing rates this fall is correct. And now we even have Christine Lagarde at the IMF, uh, in effect, almost warning or lecturing Yellen that she should not raise rates in such a soft environment. Uh, that's exactly right, Jeff. You know, it's obviously a delicate relationship when the uh, managing director of the IMF is trying to communicate publicly with the uh, chairwoman of the Federal Reserve. Uh, they can't exactly come out, uh, you know, and call each other names. But um, there's a new IMF report that just came out. This is in preparation for the uh, meeting of the G20 uh, finance ministers uh, and heads of central banks, a very high level meeting. This is in preparation for the uh, G20 uh, a summit meeting later this year in uh, in Turkey, where actually the heads of state, President Xi and President Obama and others will be there. But the uh, the G20 is a powerful group, but they don't have a full-time bureaucracy or what's called a secretariat. So they outsource that to the IMF. The IMF kind of does all the research. And they just came out with a new report today. And they they categorically said uh, that monetary conditions need to remain accommodative, uh, meaning don't tighten. Uh, But this is not the first warning. There have been a whole series of warnings from the IMF to the Fed. Uh, other prominent spokespeople have said this also, uh, Larry Summers, you know, controversial figure, but uh, I think everyone can see the fact he's got a big brain. Um, and so these warnings are coming from all over the place. And uh, Yellen, she has to be aware of them. Uh, we'll see what she does. Uh, but uh, but I said um, in late 2014 that the Fed would not raise rates in all of 2015. Uh, and of course, at the time, Wall Street was saying March, then they said June. Uh, Then they said September. My expectation is that September will come and go and they'll start talking about December. They just seem to kind of keep moving the goalposts three months. But when I said that, it wasn't a a wild guess. I mean, I I actually take the Fed at their word. Uh, The Fed says it was data dependent. Uh, The data is weak. It's getting weaker, actually. And so it's a pretty easy call to say they can't raise rates. The the question is, uh, how come I could figure that out and some others could figure that out, but the Fed couldn't? Um, How come they, they couldn't figure out their own rate? path. And the answer is that um, they base their expectations and all their tough talk about rates was based on the forecast. And the forecast, they have the worst forecasting record of any institution I can think of. They've been wrong by orders of magnitude six years in a row. So when I see the Fed has a kind of rosy forecast, I immediately uh, assume the opposite is going to be true. But um, if you're basing it on hard data and good forecasting, it's easy to see they can't raise rates. If you're basing it on the Fed's forecast, uh, you, you can see where the rate talk comes from, but they have a very flawed model. But do you ever get the sense that Janet Yellen is flailing? I mean, she's talked about the limits to monetary policy, but as you pointed out, you could always do more QE. You could always uh, venture into negative interest rates, right? I mean, what's what's her next play? Well, that's a really good question, Jeff. The, the toolkit is not empty. You know, everyone says, well, they're at the zero bound, they can't cut, so there's nothing more they can do. That's not uh, true, for better or worse. I think I think a lot of these things don't work, by the way, but who you know, who cares what I think? The Fed thinks they work, and that's the important thing. But they've got five uh, tools in the toolkit. One is more quantitative easing, so call it QE4. Uh, another one is negative interest rates. Uh, which has been used in Europe, but has not been used in the U.S., but that's possible. Uh, the third one is they can rejoin the currency wars, which means cheap in the dollar. The dollar is at uh, not an all-time high, but uh, close to it and at a uh, sort of a 10-year high. Uh, so they could cheapen the dollar again. 
Uh, another thing they could do is, is helicopter money. That's not well understood, but what helicopter money means, you actually have to work with the Congress, and the Congress would create a larger deficit, and then the Treasury would issue notes to cover the deficit, and then with a wink and the nod, the Fed would say, well, to the Treasury, well, don't worry, we'll buy the notes. So it's a form of quantitative easing in the sense that uh, the Fed is going to print more money to buy the notes, but they do it in conjunction or coordination with a larger deficit. So what that does, it creates money. But instead of giving it to the banks, which is normal QE, they give it right to the people, put it in people's pockets uh, in the form of tax cuts. So that's the difference between helicopter money and QE. Helicopter money, you you disintermediate the banks and give it right to the people. And the fifth thing they could do is go back to forward guidance, you know, call it jawboning or whatever. That's, you know, they ended forward guidance uh, last um, winter uh, when they removed the word patient from the statement. Patient was the the, the you know, we will be patient about raising rates. I think that was the phrase. But patient was the latest in a long line of uh, words and phrases. I think they 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 probably worn out their thesaurus at the Fed uh, coming up with these. But you know they they say we're not going to raise rates for an extended period. Then they say we're not going to raise rates for a considerable period. Even earlier, going back to 2010, they stuck in some dates. They said you know in 2010 they said we're not going to raise rates until 2013. Well you know 2013 came and went. And they start talking about 2014. Then they gave that up. So they ended for guys. They could go back to that. They could say, um, you know, we're going to be very patient this time about raising rates. But here's the thing. If they did any of those things, that would be a form of ease relative to expectations because the market is expecting tightening. The, the timing is up in the air, but the market it still expects tightening. But I don't think that's what's going to happen. I don't think they'll raise rates. We talked about that. But I don't think they'll go to any of these easing techniques either. I think what they'll do is not raise rates, but continue to talk tough, continue to give markets reason to expect that um, they will raise rates, you know, perhaps at the next meeting, December or early in 2016 at this point. The question is, and I think this is kind of what you were getting at, is um, what about your credibility? How many times, can, you know, this is like the boy who cried wolf, how many times can you say rate hike, rate hike, rate hike before you lose um, credibility? But the Fed's problem is they're going to have to choose between credibility and catastrophe. Uh, if they don't raise rates, they're going to slowly lose credibility. But if they do raise rates in a weak environment, they'll cause an emerging markets meltdown. So it's sort of, uh, this is what happens when you manipulate uh, every market in the world for seven years. You paint yourself into a corner and you can't escape the room. But that's just it, right? The rest of the world is very much affected by this. I mean, when you when you talk and write about currency wars... Do you think people really understand that it is a form of political war? Do they do inv investors sort of think it's actually some kind of benevolent form of economic competition? Well, it's definitely a form of economic competition, uh, but it's not benevolent. Uh, and of course, I've said that all along, going back to my first book, uh, Currency Wars, because you know, part of what we're discussing uh, comes out of my second book, The Death of Money, that came out in 2014. But go all the way back to my first book, Currency Wars, which came out in uh, 2011, um, I made the point that uh, you know the, the, the conventional wisdom is that you cut your currency, and this will uh, cheapen your currency, this will make your exports more attractive. You'll get more export orders uh, that'll create more jobs, give your economy stimulus, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I made the point then that that's not what happens, that you can cheapen your currency. There are ways of doing that. But uh, you don't get more exports. Well, all you get is inflation. And I've made the point all along, and I think this is uh, um, you know, consistent with um, Austrian economics, is that the way you generate exports is through value added technology, education, innovation. I mean, I buy German cars. I don't buy German cars because they're a little bit cheaper this week. I buy them because they're great cars. Um, or we buy French wine or we take a, an Italian vacation, whatever it may be. But we, we do that because of the, um, of the perceived value in, in the uh, in the whatever it is that's being offered, um, rather than the fact that it's you know ten percent cheaper this week. So, but what does happen is you import inflation because remember. In a two-way trading system, you're not just an exporter, you're also an importer. So if you cheapen your currency, the price of your imports goes up, and that inflation tends to feed into the supply chain and make prices in general go up. And that's actually why they do it. I mean, they uh, governments always say they're cheapening the currency to encourage the exports, but they actually know better. What they're doing is trying to get inflation because the world is facing a deflationary uh, meltdown, a deflationary liquidity trap, and everyone's trying to get out of it. 
The problem with all this, Jeff, is that uh, one country can benefit in the short run. I emphasize short run. It's not a long run solution at all. It can give you a little boost in the short run, but it comes at the expense of your trading partners. So one country might be a little better off for a short period of time, but the world is worse off. And that's what we're seeing. This is very much a replay of the 1930s. Uh, a little bit of a slow motion replay, not quite as severe, but could be more prolonged. I mean, look at Japan. They've been in uh, depression for 25 years. I talk about a 25-year U.S. depression, and people kind of laugh out loud. But I say, look, it started in 2007. We're already eight years into it. We only have 17 to go. But I don't see any way out absent uh, structural reforms. Well, you talk about structural reforms. I mean, the world is awash in debt. You know, we're not, we're not just talking about the the sovereign debt of individual governments, but all the bad debt owned by commercial banks, for instance, all the household debt that may well never be repaid. Do you almost feel like we're like we're ripe for some sort of global reset or monetary realignment? Well, that's going to be a necessity. The short answer is yes, I, I do see that. And by the way, that is the condition in which currency wars arise. Um, and again, I said that in my first book, the world is not always in a currency war. But when we are, they can last for a long time. They can go on for 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, this, the currency war we're in now started in 2010. Uh, I'm not the least bit surprised that here we are in 2015. And it's still going on. And people say, um, oh, gee, how did you, you know, how did you know five years ago that we'd still be in a currency war? And the answer is because that's the way they uh, they roll. They do last for a very long period of time. And the reason for that is they don't have a logical conclusion. You know, I cheapen my currency to get the edge on you and then you cheapen your currency. Well, just multiply that by you know, 168 members of the IMF. And you can see that that really has no end. The only way currency wars end, there are two ways. One is systemic reform. Uh, which I think is maybe what you mean by a global reset, where you, know, you have a Bretton Woods style conference for at least something like the Plaza um, Agreement in 1985, where um, you know the leaders of the major trading financial powers get together and they just say, "Look, this is ridiculous. We need to, you know, re reshuffle the deck and uh, come up with a new deal." So that's one way out. The other way out is systemic collapse, where the system just falls apart, as it did on the verge of World War One, World War Two, uh, and again in 1971 when uh, Nixon suspended the convertibility of the dollar into gold. So you either get systemic reform or systemic collapse. And actually, if you have systemic collapse, that would force systemic reform. So one way or the other, you get to a global reset. Interestingly, I've had private discussions uh, in the last couple of months with uh, Ben Bernanke, of course, former chairman of the Federal Reserve, and John Lipsky. John was former head of the IMF. So, you know, you've got two, uh, you know, two individuals, both uh, PhD economists who headed the two most powerful financial institutions in the world. Uh, 10,000 miles apart, I spoke to Bernanke in Korea and I spoke to John in, uh, in Washington. And they both used the same word to describe the international monetary system. They both said, this is incoherent. I thought it was really interesting that they chose the same word. I'm not suggesting that they, uh, you know, cooked it up for my benefit. It just shows that the people who are most knowledgeable about the system are looking at it and know that it doesn't work. So we're heading for one of these two outcomes. My concern is that uh, because of denial, delay, and sort of, you know, pulling rabbits out of a hat, such as quantitative easing, uh, they're going to delay the reform to the point where we actually have the collapse. Uh, and then, um, again, we'll see. Uh, that, and that's really what I'm trying to do for readers and um, subscribers to my newsletter and, and you know, people on interviews like this is just say, you know, let's, let's put ourselves into that scenario and see how it plays out and, and then come backwards and say, what would you be doing today with your portfolio to prepare for that kind of monetary reset? That reset might come on the heels of a euro or a dollar end game, right? And you've talked quite a bit about the role that IMF special drawing rights might play in a new uh, uh, global system. And, and years ago, Pat Buchanan talked about how he saw uh, the future of currency as being one of two things, either some sort of collapse whereby nations retreated to their own nationalist impulses and interests with their own currencies, like a resurrection of European currencies, for instance, or that there would be some sort of monster global currency. And, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on whether the IMF special drawing rights are going to be that monster global currency in that scenario. Well, I, I, first of all, I agree with uh, Buchanan. I would add one element. So Buchanan said either we'll sort of the world will retreat and go autark autarkic and uh, come up with uh, local currencies instead or go to a monster global currency. There's a third path I would put in the mix, which would be um, a gold standard of some kind. And, you know, when I say gold standard, I know uh, Austrian economists have a very 
definitive view of what that means, you know, no fractional reserve and, you know, one-to-one -one ratio and gold to back dollars, et cetera. And that's one way to do it. It's not the only way to do it. There are other ways to structure a gold standard, some more rigorous than others, some um, not much more than using gold as a reference point. Um, and, uh, you know, some uh, uh, spokesmen have, have talked about that. But anyway, take the whole, the whole spectrum from, uh, you know, fully backed by gold, no fractional reserve at the one hand to just using it as a frame of reference on the other. But that's a spectrum of various types of gold standard. Uh, and I would put that in the mix as well. There's no no doubt that global monetary elites and, you know, by the way, when I use the phrase elite, for use the phrase elites, I'm not talking about some, you know, black helicopter conspiracy. I mean, we know who these people are. I mean, it's, you know, it's Christine Lagarde and Janet Yellen and Marty Feldstein and Corrode at the Bank of Japan and, uh, you know, the heads of central banks and finance ministers and leading academics and uh, powerful financiers, people like Jamie Dimon and, you know, the, the people who show up at Davos, in other words, we know who they are. It's not a mystery. Uh, what they want is the SDR. They want a global currency. I mean, the great uh, Mundell, uh, Robert Mundell, Nobel Prize winner, said, uh, oh, I think 50 years ago, the optimal currency zone is the world. He said, as long as you have more than one currency in play, there's going to be some transaction cost or some inefficiency or some arbitrage that you're going to have to deal with. So the world's moving slowly in that direction. Now, uh, we're, and that would be the SDR. That would be the special drawing, right? That's this world money issued by the IMF acting in its capacity and effect as de facto central bank of the world. Um, gold is out there. You know, maybe a gold-backed SDR is not such a bad idea. In other words, take Mundell's idea of an optimal currency zone with the whole world using SDRs, but combine it with, you know, an, an old Austrian idea of a, a gold standard. Uh, the problem, uh, th that could work theoretically. The problem with that is, uh, the accountability of the IMF. The IMF doesn't answer to anybody. Uh, they're self-appointed, self-perpetuating. I mean, they have articles of agreement, and you know, I know it came out of the Bretton Woods um, uh, agreements, et cetera. So there is some governance there, but uh, Khan is, is reporting to the G20 these days, and they're unelected, uh, non-democratic. Uh, you've got everything from kings and dictators dictators and communists uh, side by side with, uh, you know, functioning democracies, et cetera. So um, I, I'm a little troubled by the lack of accountability. But the third thing, let's go to Buchanan's other point, I, and I agree, and I talked about this in my book, Currency Wars, um, that the system would actually break up into little blocks. We're seeing that also. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister of um, uh, Russia, Vladimir Putin, uh, announced the other day that he's, he's advancing the ruble as a regional reserve currency. Now, the ruble is not ready to, uh, to perform a role as a global reserve currency. That's not even close. But in their periphery, basically the former Soviet Union, or most of it, or the former uh, CIS, Commonwealth of Independent States, uh, you know, Belarus, Kyrgyzstan, um, Russia itself, and some of the other um, autonomous republics around it, that they their in, inter uh, that their trade uh, and interactions would be denominated in rubles, it basically is a way of getting rid of the dollar. And of course, we see the Chinese yuan expanding as well. So, uh, so I think all all three horses are in the race. And I don't want to predict a winner. What I'm trying to do is uh, keep an eye on the horses, see who's ahead. And um, you know, help uh, hopefully help investors structure their portfolios in such a way that no matter what happens, uh, they come out with their wealth preserved. Well, Jim, we only have time for one more short question. It seems to me that in any sort of reset scenario, there are winners and losers, right? Now, the, the U.S. has been thought of as a winner for, out of the Bretton Woods Agreement, and certainly the petrodollar arrangement has benefited uh, the U.S. tremendously. Um, you know, are winners and losers going to be identifiable if this IMF-led process begins? And doesn't that uh, raise the specter of... Uh, of war or tension? Well, I think winners and losers are identifiable. And again, that's what I spend um, kind of most of my time doing. It goes back to your earlier question, Jeff, about the debt. Um, the depression and currency wars, what are the preconditions for that? Well, the preconditions are too much debt, not enough growth. Simple as that. Too much debt, not enough gro growth. When was the last time the world saw this? Well, uh, after World War One in, in 1919, 1920, uh, you know, Germany owed uh, owners reparations to England and France. Uh, England and France owed enormous war debts to the United States. Uh, nobody was forgiving any of the debt. Everyone was insisting on payment in full. There wasn't enough to go around. 
Uh, and that led to an outbreak of currency wars, and that led to a Great Depression, and then in turn led to World War II. So uh, there was a, you know, and then trade wars uh, thrown on top of that. So there was a very uh, a deleterious and destructive uh, path uh, that came out of that. Um, we saw the same thing in the um, late 1960s, early 1970s. Uh, England had still still had too much debt, uh, had not paid off its World War II debt, and the U.S. was going into debt uh, to finance the combination of the Great Society and the Vietnam War, uh, the so-called guns and butter policy of President Johnson. Uh, so there, there was a, the reset wasn't um, it wasn't World War III, it wasn't deflation and depression. There, the reset was inflation. Uh, enormous inflation. We, from 1977 to 1981, the United States had 50 percent inflation, five zero, in a five-year period. I know, um, uh, you know, Ron Paul and, and Austrians like to point to the uh, tenure of the Federal Reserve, and they'll say, you know, since the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913, uh, the dollar has lost 95 percent of its purchasing power, which is true. But uh, you know, no matter what you have left, you can always lose 95 percent of what you have left, and uh, that's. What happened in set from 77 to 81, there was a 50 percent devaluation in a very short period of time. Uh, and that solved the problem. It was but it caused enormous disruption, enormous losers. So who were the winners and losers in these various scenarios? Well, in inflation, and th there's no question that central banks, the IMF, the global elites, the use of SDRs, all that is designed to cause inflation. By the way, it's all failing so far. They haven't really played the SDR card. Uh, very, very aggressively, but uh, but they could, and I do expect that in the future. But uh, you know, I call this Mick Jagger economics. Uh, the Rolling Stones had a song called "You Can't Always Get What You Want." Uh, the Fed wants inflation, but they they can't get it. They've been failing to get it for uh, for eight years in a row. But if the inflation comes, the losers are you know savers, uh, anyone with a fixed income. If you have an insurance policy, an annuity, a retirement, a savings account. Anything where you depend on the amount of dollars, at nominal dollars, uh, you'll be one of the losers in that. Uh, deflation, uh, up to a point, the uh, the debtors lose because the real value of debt goes up. But you have to play that through. So you say, okay, well, we have deflation. The value of debt goes up. Uh, my debt becomes more and more onerous. And that gets back to your point about dollar-denominated debt issued by companies in emerging markets. And uh, the BIS estimates there's $9 trillion dollars of dollars denominated debt issued by private sector emerging markets borrowers. These are not sovereigns where you can go to the IMF and get a loan. These are corporations, state-owned enterprises. This is from, you know, you name it, Brazil, Turkey, Indonesia, Malaysia, Russia, China. China's a big, uh, big player in this. So, but the problem is uh, with more and more deflation, as the debt gets more and more onerous, what do they do? They default. So it kind of comes back to the creditors. The creditors are, are feeling that they're, they're, the value of the debt's going up for a while, which feels good until the guy actually doesn't pay you. Uh, and then you destroy the banking system. And then you get to hyperdeflation. But since central banks can't tolerate that, you come back to inflation. So I think all roads lead to inflation. But what's not clear is are we going to go straight to inflation? Or are we going to have a more severe deflationary episode, which will then be resolved by going to inflation by increasing the price of gold, which, of course, is exactly what happened in 1933. So my advice for investors is be prepared for both and use what I call the barbell strategy. So have, have your inflation hedges, which would include gold, land, uh, perhaps some fine art, um, and uh, have your deflation hedges, which would include, uh, say, ten-year Treasury notes, cash, um, and you know other very liquid assets, and then have a big slug of cash in the middle. Um, people are surprised to hear me say that. They say, "Hey, Jim, you're the guy talking about the death of money. Why would you have cash?" Well, the answer is, I might not have it forever, but you might have it in the short run for three reasons. One, it's a good deflation hedge. The value of cash goes up in deflation. Number two, it reduces the volatility of the rest of your portfolio, uh, which can help you sleep better at night. Number three, it has huge embedded optionality. If if the world's falling apart in unexpected ways, the person with cash is the person who can pivot and, and take advantage. Of that so um, some inflation hedges some deflation hedges cash to give you optionality and just watch what's going on and again this is what I try to do in my newsletter because uh, you know I get comments from people they say well you know you, you, you told me to do this and this isn't working out and I said well yeah I said that two years ago or you you know you have to keep listening uh, you have to stay tuned you can't just uh, you know as the, as the expression goes set it and forget it um, in, in an environment like this which is dynamically unstable you have to be very nimble and you have to be kind of paying attention all the time and again that's exactly the service we try to provide in my newsletter
Tim Rickards, thanks so much for your time, and I hope you'll join us again sometime. I hope so. Thank you, Jeff. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. 